Now this teaching is going to show us how we are when we don't have our eyes on the Lord. This is about David and Goliath, the little, the little man against the big man. And really it's just a boy, he's not even a man yet. How we are when we don't have our eyes and our faith on the Lord. In 1 Samuel chapter 8 verse 5, it tells us that Israel wanted a king because they wanted to be like other nations. And in verses 11 through 22, God tells them what kind of king they were going to get. And so he tells them that this king would take away their sons and use them to take care of his fields. He would take away their daughters and force them to be his cooks and bake for him. He would take the best of their fields and give them to his friends. He would take a tenth of their harvest. He would use their servants for his own personal gain. This is what, this is what Samuel, Samuel's the prophet in, the, in this book, okay, in this story. And Samuel tells him, this is what you want a king. God said, this is the kind of king you're going to get. He uses Samuel to tell them, okay, you want a king? This is what the king's going to do. But the people refused to listen to Samuel and said, we want a king. So they wanted to be like everyone else. He said, like I said, up in verse uh, 5, they wanted to be like other nations. They had a king, so they, were, they, they weren't happy with God being their king. Now, we can take this to the other level and think, okay, what do we want that's not of God, but we want to be like other people? Do you understand what I'm saying? There's times, well, there's a lot of times we do that. Because the other people are doing it, well, we want to do it too. And the church, they're about 10 years behind the world. But the world, first they come out with, and I'll use the women, with bathing suits. Now in the old times, the women wore bathing suits and they were still completely clothed. They didn't show anything. But then the world came out with bathing suits where they started showing a little bit of leg, you know. And then they come out, finally they came out with the bikini. Well, the world, the Christians, the Christians, about 10 years after that, Christians were, they were okay in it because they wanted to be like them. And I'm just using the girls as an example. But we, we follow the world. We really do. The world starts it, and then within about 10 years, <coughs> it's okay to do it in the church or where it or whatever it is. And this is what is happening here. Israel wanted a king just like the world had the king. So we've got to watch ourselves because we're going to learn from here, you know, hey, I want it God's way or do I want it my way? Do I want to follow the world or do I want to follow the Lord? Israel right here wanted to follow the, the world because they had kings so they wanted a king. And Samuel told them exactly what this king was going to be, right? But they said, no, no, no. We want a king. So Samuel told God, which he already, he already heard, but Samuel told God that they still wanted a king and God told Samuel, okay, give them what they want. And as you read the book of Samuel, you'll see they got exactly what they wanted. They got a king, but they got everything that came with that king. So when we pray, when we pray and say, Lord, I want this or I want that, we need to try to make sure it's from the Lord, that it's in God's will that we have it. Because if we keep asking for it, He knows it's not good for us. But if we keep on and keep on and keep on, He might end up giving it to you and then what happens? We have to suffer whatever the consequences is from wanting whatever it is. You understand what I'm saying? So this, just that little bit right here shows us be careful what we ask for. In chapter 10 of 1 Samuel, verse 1, God told Samuel, okay, let me anoint, Samuel, I want you to anoint Saul to be king. Saul was the first king that Israel had. And in 1 Samuel chapter 26 verse 9 it says, And David said, Destroy him not. Now this is David. This is further down but I'm using this as an ex to show that Saul is a man of God even though he totally got away from him. But Saul is a man of God because it says, And David said, Destroy him not 
for who can stretch forth his hand against the Lord's anointed? Knowing that Saul was anointed by God. These two verses, Samuel, the prophet, anointed Saul. And then right here, David says, don't put your hand against the anointed one. So, so Saul was a man of God. But we're going to see later on, he got away from the Lord. In chapter 15, verse 3, God told Saul to destroy and to kill everything. They went into battle and they took over this city. And God told him to kill everything. He said, kill all the men, all the women, all the children, all the animals. Which we'll, we see a lot of that in the Bible. Where God said, destroy everything. And you think, man, he's a mean God. Well, guess what? On the day of Noah, what happened? Eight, eight people were saved. The rest, children, men, women, animals, weren't they all killed? When God brings judgment down, if you're not right with God, now, of course, the children in the time of Noah, the babies, the little kids, they, they went to heaven because they never got to the age of accountability. But everybody else, the animals and the adults, men and women, gone. So God told him to destroy everything. And in verses 8 through 11, it says that Saul spared the king. And they didn't kill all the animals. They kept the best of the sheep, the oxen, and the, and the lambs for a sacrifice to the Lord. And because of this, God said it repented him for making Saul the king over Israel. Because already the, this king is obeying God, disobeying God. God said destroy everything and he, he let the king live and he kept the best of the animals for a sacrifice to the Lord. Now you think, well, he, he kept them so he can make a sacrifice to the Lord. Verse 19, it says, Then Samuel asked Saul, Why didn't you obey God? God said do this. Now I know you kept them so you can sacrifice to the Lord, but that's not what he wanted. You disobeyed God. And in verse 22, Samuel said to Saul, Obeying is better than sacrifice. Obeying is better than sacrifice. John 15, 14, Ye are my friends. If ye do whatsoever I command you. This is what the Lord wants. He wants, you to, he wants us to do whatever He commands us. Jeremiah 7, 23, but this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice. God says, Obey my voice. And I will be your God, and you shall be my people. And walk in, walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it, that it may be well unto you. So the Lord wants us to listen. He wants us to obey. This is like people who think by going to church, oh, that's, you know, I can please God by going to church. I live this way, but as long as I go to church, that should be good enough. God wants our obedience. You got people who tithe. They still live the way they want, but they tithe because they think that's going to make them right with God. Oh, I give to the church. God wants obedience. And right here, Saul thought, well, I don't know if he was thinking he was doing good, but he didn't. He disobeyed God. That was the bottom line. He disobeyed God. He did it his way, thinking his way was a good way. And then 1 Samuel 15, verses 24 through 26, and verse 35. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, transgressed the commandments of the Lord, and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. He feared the people and obeyed their voice. In Acts 5, 29, it says, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Saul up here feared the people and obeyed the people instead of fearing the Lord and obeying the Lord. And then Peter in the New Testament says, Hey, we ought to obey, obey God rather than men. Which we have a lot of, I'm going to say people, but then we also have a lot of Christians who do the same thing. Yeah. What the pastor or teacher says is more 
means more to them than if they were just to sit down and read the words of God. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. They can read it, but they're like, but this is a pastor. You know, what he says, because he's got the title as pastor or right. teacher. But we need to get away from that. We need to read the scriptures, and that's why we read the scriptures in this Bible study. We read the scriptures. You're not listening to Jesse. You know you're not listening to me. Because I give you scriptures after scriptures. So if you're listening to me, you're listening to the words of God. Because that's all I use. But you got preachers out there, or teachers, they'll give you one verse, and then they'll teach or preach for 45 minutes on that one verse. Never give you another verse. Watch who you listen to. It's better to obey God than to please men and obey them. And in verse 25 it says, Now therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin, and turn again with me, that, it may, that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. When we will disobey the Lord, you know, some of us, uh, I know this is not right, but, but sometimes when we disobey, sometimes the Lord really gives us a good chastising. He really does. He, he, he lets us slip, not slip, but get away with some sin, a little, you know, maybe a little here, a little there. But don't count on it all the time. I would fear to sin. I have weaknesses and I do sin. And I do ask for forgiveness. But when you're out there and you're like, eh, and you take it as no big deal that you're doing this sin, that's not that big of a deal, watch it. Isaiah 59, 2, it says, But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid His face from you that He will not hear. When you have sin, it separates us from God. Who wants to be separated from God? I'd be scared to death to be scared separated from God. Yeah. And he says he don't hear us. So when you want your prayers answered, don't be separated from God. Because guess what? Right here it says he don't hear you. If you have some sin in your life and you're, you're really not repentant of it, and you're living in it, the Lord doesn't hear you. In fact, it separates you from God. And your prayers are going no further than the ceiling. So if you want your prayers to be answered, if you want your prayers to be heard, if you're praying for like your family, for, for whatever reason, someone in your family, someone you love, walk with the Lord. Walk with the Lord and He'll hear you pray for that person. Mm -hmm. Amen? And in verse 35, And Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death. Nevertheless, Samuel mourned for Saul, and the Lord repented that he had made Saul king over Israel. So Samuel the prophet was very close to Saul, but he had to separate, he had to separate himself from Saul. Because Saul was not walking with the Lord. Sometimes we have to do things like that. If we have a good close friend, and this friend is not walking with the Lord, we need to separate ourselves from him. We pray for him or her, but we don't walk with him. We can still love him, but we don't walk with him. Now the enemy, I'm sure... They heard about the division in Israel with the king and the prophet. Every king had a prophet to tell him words from the Lord. And the Philistines, I'm sure they heard about there was a division between the king and the prophet. So they figured this was a, was a good time to attack Israel, the Philistines, okay? And now starting with 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle. And were gathered together at the Sokol, which belonged to Judah, and pitched between Sokoth and Ezekiah and Ephdemon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and pitched by the valley of Eleth, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. And there went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. 
which that's about 11 foot tall. Goliath was about 11 foot tall. Verse 5. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of his, the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had a greaves of brass upon his head, legs, and had a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaven beam, and his spear head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And one bearing a shield went before him. Now, this is about 180 pounds of, of what he had on. All this stuff they just mentioned, his helmet and everything, everything he had on, if you look at it, it weighs about 180 pounds. That's how much he was carrying. In verse 8, And he stood and cried unto the armies of Israel and said unto them, Why are you come out to set your battle in array? Am not I a Philistine, and ye servants to Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. This is a servant of the devil, because he's, he's attacking the armies of God. The devil uses people all the time. He always does. He does it today. And Goliath says, and you have just a man that rules over you. Say so he knows that Israel is only a man is under a man. That God is well, he believes God is no longer protecting Israel because he knows that the king and the prophet is no longer side by side. So they like I said, they think God is not with them now. And these Philistines, they have no fear because they they've gone up against God before in battle and lost. But right now they don't have no fear of it. Because of what I just said. And Goliath has already shown that he's down in the valley. Remember there there is a valley there. He's come down there on the mountainside, right? Now Goliath has already come down into the valley to fight. And in verse 9, if he be able to fight with me and kill me, this is what Goliath is saying. And if he kills me, then will we be your servants? But if I prevail against him and kill him, then shall ye, ye be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistines, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. So Saul and his army, when they heard him saying this, it says right here, they were scared. They didn't have to be afraid though. Because God, because God told them in Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 16, He told them that they would destroy all that the Lord has delivered to them. This is what the Lord has told Israel. He also, and also in uh, verse 17 of chapter 7, He says, Don't think in your heart these nations are too big for me to conquer. God is saying, don't think there's any, there's, there's not an army out there too big for that I can't handle. Amen. That's what he's telling Israel. It, God's telling Israel this, okay? Listen to, listen to what God is telling them. Also in uh, verse 24, God said he would deliver all the kings into their hands and destroy them. This is God telling Israel all these things. I mean, these are if God says it, this is a promise. It's going to happen if they receive it. Remember, we if we believe God and accept His words and do His words, then we can receive the blessings from them. Also in 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 13, God tells Samuel, God tells Samuel, He says, The hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the day of his life. God said, All of your life, the hand of the Lord would be against the Philistines. So, we got the prophet who has the promise from God. And then we got these other promises from God to Israel. And what happens? They're scared. Yeah. They, won't even, they won't even go down in the valley to fight the giant. The giant. The 11 foot giant. Do we? Do we have 11 foot giants in our life? Yes. Yes, we do. Now, we can be like Saul, the king. Which was a mighty, he was a mighty warrior. The Bible says he was. But this mighty warrior was scared of that giant. Not only him, but his men also. Yeah. 
they were all scared of the giant. We're talking about the giant, not even the army of, of the Philistines. Because it was only Goliath that was down in the valley. Not the army of, Philist of the Philistines, just Goliath. And nobody would go down there. They were scared because they were looking with what eyes? Flesh. Their fleshly eyes. Looking with your fleshly eyes will always get you in trouble. What you see as a giant, what God sees is nothing. Amen. In verse 12, the Lord leaves what's happening and he talks a little bit about David. He says, Now David was the son of that Etherite of Bethlehem Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, and the man went among men for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three elder sons of Jesse went and followed Saul to battle. And the names of the three sons that went to battle were Elab the firstborn, and the next unto him was Ebedad, and the third Shema. And David was the youngest, and the three elders followed Saul. <coughs> But David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. <clears throat> now he's the youngest of eight sons, David is. That's it. <clears throat> but his three oldest brothers, they're, they're in the army of, is of Israel. They're, they're on the battlegrounds out there with, with King Saul. And it says that David was going back and forth between the battle and taking care of the sheep. Now this is what he was doing at this time. Now we go back to the battleground. Verse 16, And the Philistine drew near morning and evening, presenting himself forty days. Now the number forty seems to be a time of testing in the Bible. Time of what? Testing. Because what did Jesus do for forty days and forty nights? He went out to be tempted by the devil. Did he pass the test? Yeah. Amen. He did pass the test. Yeah. Did he fall to the Satan? No, he did not fall down and worship him. That's what Satan wanted. We got the Philistines here. Now remember also, the whole Old Testament is about who? Jesus. Jesus. So we can find spots to where, you know, that's what Jesus went through. Or that's what Jesus did or, or stuff like that. That's just like what Jesus did. And I'll show that through, through the teaching. Verse 17, And Jesus said unto David his son, Take now for thy brethren... Uh, Ephraim e, e Neha of this porch corn and these ten loaves and run to the camp to thy brethren and carry these ten cheeses unto the captain of their thousands and look how thy brethren fare and take their pledge. Now just like a father he was worried about his sons and he told David to take them some cheese and he says take their pledge meaning let me know how they're doing. That's what he was telling David. Take them this food and let me know how they're doing. Because he's worried about his three sons, his three oldest sons, because they're they're in the army, but then they're not in the battlefield yet. And in verse 19, now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. Now the Philistines were already down in the valley, from what we read in verse 8, the the, the giant was. But they weren't physically fighting. They were just yelling at each other. Because in the next verse it says, And David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with, with, the keeper, with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the trench and as the host was going forth to fight and shouted for the battle. So they were just yelling at each other. They weren't out there fighting. That's why, you know, when you read the verses, make sure you read the next verse. Because you, then you'll see, well, you would think with, right in this verse it says they were fighting. And you would think they were already fighting, physical fighting. But the next verse said they were just yelling at each other. And David did as his fathers told him. Took the corn, the bread, the cheeses to the battle crowns, and they went yelling at each other. And in verse 21, For Israel and the Philistines had put the battle in array, army against army. And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the army and came and saluted his brethren. Now David left the food with a like a quartermaster with a sheep or a keeper uh, and he went to the battlefield to see his brothers. <clears throat> and in verse 23 it says, And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, 
Goliath by name out of the armies of the Philistines and spake according to the same words and David heard them. Now, the same words where he was saying, I'll defy the armies of Israel. He was saying the same thing he had said before. But this time when he said it, this time David heard him. That he defiled the armies of Israel. David could have been, who is this giant who's defiling the armies of God? Because this is God's army. This is the army of Israel, but it's God's army. All right. And David looks at it that way. And David's saying, who is this that's defiling the armies of God? Now, David was a man of God. The Bible says he was a man after God's own heart. And David is hearing what this guy, this Philistine is saying. And in verse 20, 24, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. What happened to the children of God? And these, these are... This is God's people, Israel, right? This is His people. So what happened to His children? Again, like I said, they saw with their physical eyes this big evil giant. That's what they saw. And what did they do? They ran. How many times did we run? And we do run. And my, it's, it's a different situation, but there's giants in our life, and a lot of times we don't want to attack the giant. We'd rather just stay away from the giant. We'd rather lose a blessing that the Lord says, hey, you can have that or whatever, but we see something with our eyes and go, mm, no, because we're scared. And God has made us many, many prom promises. And we are missing out on many, many of the blessings of these promises. We are. Because we are a lot of times we act like the army of Israel. We look with these eyes. While they ran away, we're going to see in verse 48 that David ran to meet Goliath. This man of God, David, ran to meet Goliath when the armies of Israel was running away from him. That's the difference between someone who's walking with the Lord and someone who is not. If you're not walking with the Lord, you're going to run. Because things are going to scare us. And we're going to run from it. But when you're walking with the Lord, we'll be just like David. That's nothing for me. Amen. That's, no, that's nothing for my God is what we say. Amen. So Israel ran, the army of Israel ran away. David, the boy, which was not 18 yet, the boy was mm -hmm. running to the giant. Amen? Amen. That's the kind of Christian life I want to live. I want to have that much faith in my life with the Lord that I, I'm going to run to this giant. I'm not afraid of this giant. My giant is much bigger than that giant. Amen. Amen. <laughs> this is Goliath. Big, scary looking. His roar is in, intimidating to us. His roar is. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, it says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion. Walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So we hear a lot of times in our life we hear this line and it scares us. We want to run. But we got to have faith like David. David had faith that God was going to be with him. That God was with him. David was like, you are not going to talk about my God or what belongs to him. He said, this is the army of God. This is what the devil does to us. He lies to us. And he brings us down. I know we've all been brought down here. Sometime in our, in our Christian walk, we've, brought, we've been brought down by the devil. We need to stay strong in the Word of God. We need, we need to be fed the Word of God. So this won't happen to us. Remember, 1 John 4.4 4, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We got to believe that. I mean, do you live that way? I know we know this verse already. I've taught it many times in other teachings. But do we really believe that verse? Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That's the way David felt. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Was David walking by sight? No. Or was he walking by faith? Okay. Amen. Josh, Joshua 1, 9. 
Have not I commanded thee, be strong. This is a command. The Lord says, Have, I, have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whether, wherever so thou goest. Do we believe these verses? Because if we do believe these verses, are we going to be a David? Or are we going to be like the armies of Israel? If we believe these verses, we're going to be just like David, right? <clears throat> Second Timothy 1 Timothy 1.7 For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power. Are you everything that's right here? This is what David had. This is how David attacked the giant. Because of the, this is the way he was. He knew his God was with him. Hebrews 13.5 I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Amen. As long as we're walking with the Lord, He will not leave us. And as long as we're walking with Him, no matter what situation we get into, He's going to be there. Amen. God. Man, that we should do nothing but walk in victory in our life. Every day. Right. Every day we should walk in victory. If we believe these verses, we will walk in victory. Genesis 15.1 Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield. Now, he didn't just say this to Abraham. This is for us, too. God said, I'm your shield. Come on. <laughs> really? I mean, do we, if we believe these verses, is there anything out there that, that we're scared of? No. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. 1 John 5, 18. And that wicked one touches him not. Can the wicked one touch us? No. no. Amen. Amen. Romans eight thirty seven. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. We can conquer anything that comes our way as long as we're walking with the Lord. Always remember that. As long as we're walking with the Lord, we can conquer anything. Because who is our shield? God. He protects us. Deuteronomy 7.24 There shall no man be able to stand before thee. Is there anything we should be scared of? Now, I'm not talking about just people now. I'm talking about situations also. Different things that come into our life. Things that can get us down because, God, I don't know how I'm going to do that. Or, or it's just stuff like that. And we're not just talking about people here. We're talking about things that can come into your life. Situations. You know, like, man, I don't know how we're going to make it through this. And we say that. We say that. I don't know how we're going to make it through this. Or, or something like that. When we're in a situation where we're, where we're saying that, man, I don't know how I'm going to get out of this. You're right. You don't know how you're going to get out of it. But what do we do? Lord, help me. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to do here, but I know you can handle it. Amen. And whatever comes about it or whatever happens with it, uh, it's your will. Because I'm giving it to you. Because I can't tackle this, but you're my God. Yep. You take care of me, and I believe that. Amen. That's what we do. When we see a giant, we give it to the Lord. We give that giant, no matter what person or situation, we give it to the Lord. And we got to learn how to give it to the Lord. Because you can say, Lord, I'm giving it to you. But then we, then we sit back and we worry about it. That's not giving it to the Lord. If you're taking it, if you're worrying about it, then you haven't given it to the Lord. When you give it to the Lord, that means, hey, it's yours I'm not going to worry about it. And when we're walking with the Lord, when we're right with the Lord, amen, we can do that. Amen. Our Father, is, He's always ready to take on our problems. <laughs> Lord, I got this giant over here. Can you take care of him for me? Or that situation, can you take care of it for me? And God says, hey, I got it. Amen. amen? I'm serious. That's the Texas way of saying it. I got it. <laughs> huh? Amen. Amen. Now back to verse 25. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that is come up? Surely to defile Israel he is come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. Remember, this has been going on for 40 days. And he's been doing it twice a day. <clears throat> Now there's four men, there's four men who should have gone out against this giant instead of David. Should have been four men. 
First was the king. Saul, being the king, he should have went out because he's the greatest, right? The Bible always says he was a great warrior. He should have been out there. He didn't go. Second, Jonathan, the son of Saul, who also was a mighty warrior. In chapter 13 and 14, it shows that he was a mighty warrior. And the third man was Eliath, David's oldest brother, who was a prince and a warrior also. This is what the Bible, taught. The Bible says. These men are this way. So he should have been out there. He didn't go. And the fourth man was Abner, the commander-in-chief of the army, the uncle of Saul. These were great men in God's army. But today they weren't. For 40 days they weren't. They were afraid. It says in verse 24, it says they were all afraid. These great men of, of God were afraid. The king, the head of the house. Now listen to me. The king, the head of Israel, the head of the house, he was scared. And when you see your leader scared, What's that going to make you? Scared. If your leader is scared and you're following him, that's going to make you scared too. So men, especially men, don't show fear. When you're in a family situation, show your wife, show your children, hey, I got it because I'm giving it to the Lord. I don't worry about it. I'm giving it to the Lord. And when they see that, they're going to follow you. But if, you're like, if, but if you're the other way, like Israel here, and you're scared of it, guess what that does to your family? They don't have no reason to follow you, and that makes them scared. Because right. their head is, is, a, is afraid. Verse 26. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine, and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God. David's attitude was here, right here was totally different from everyone else. This, this made David mad that this giant was, was saying this against God's army. His attitude was totally different from everyone else. Everyone else was scared. David's right here saying, Who, who is this? Who, who is this that, think, that they think they can go up against my God? That's the way he's, that's, that was David's attitude. Pretty good attitude. Yeah. It's the kind of attitude I want. Mm -hmm. The men of Israel saw him as a fearful giant. But David saw him as a nobody. You hear me? David looked at the giant as a nobody. Why? Because he was a man of God walking with the Lord. Can we learn from this? Mm -hmm. Amen. We can learn from this. Goliath has already brought disgrace on Israel by challenging them. Not, I mean, from the king on down, he, he's done challenged them. And they're afraid. He, he, has, he has disgraced them. Because here is his army, an army, and they're scared to go out and fight. Now David, with the Lord, is going to change that. David, this boy. Boy, remember, David is a boy. He's not even 18 yet. Because to be in the army in Israel, you had to be, uh, I think, 20, uh, I believe it was 20 years old. You couldn't go into the army until you reached 20. So he's under 20. And this boy has more courage, has more strength, has more faith than the, these men. Why do you think David has such great faith? Part of the reason is because in Psalms 1-2, it says, to meditate on the Lord day and night. That verse is telling us we should always, always be alert. We should meditate on the Lord day and night. Because guess what? We're being attacked day and night. There's temptations out there on us every day. So every day we should meditate on the Lord. And that's probably what David did. Who wrote Psalms? David. David. You want to get good, great, have great faith? Now, what's he meditating on? What do you meditate on? The Word of God. When it says to meditate on Him day and night, this is what we're meditating on. The words that we read. So we keep the words close to our heart and we meditate on them. 
So when times like this come, when a giant comes into your into your house, you're prepared. Amen? Amen. Verse 27. And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eleb, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the man, and Eleb's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why comest thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thy heart. For thou art come down that thou mayest see the battle. No. David's oldest brother is getting on him. He's getting on him. He's angry with him. Not because of what he says here, but because he has embarrassed his big brother. Well, all three of his brothers. But his big brother is the one who's saying something. His brother is mad at him, angry with him, because David's out there acting as a man and not a boy, like they are. Y'all hear me? Mm -hmm. His brother is trying to belittle David by saying, we can only trust you with a few sheep. He's trying to belittle him like, like you're nobody, you know, what are you doing here? Remember, the Old Testament is about Jesus. Luke 24-27, it says, and, and, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself, speaking about Jesus. From the time of Moses and the prophets, they spoke about Jesus. Luke 24, 44. And he said unto them, These are the words which I have spoken unto you, while I was with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which were written in the law of the Moses and, and in the prophets, and in the Psalms concerning me. That's what Jesus said. So here's two verses right here. Jesus is saying, hey, the Old Testament is about me. So we need to see Jesus here. Whenever we read the Old Testament, look for Jesus because he's in there. All right. We hear, we see here that the same thing happened to Jesus in John chapter 1 verse 11. He came unto his own and his own received him not. David came unto his brothers. Did they receive him? No. No. They got angry with him. Just like Jesus. He came unto his own and his own received him not. Y'all see that? Back to verse 29. And David said, What have I done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from, his, from him toward another, and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he, went, and he sent for him. And David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Thy servant will go and fight with the Philistine. David is saying the same thing that Jesus said in John chapter 10 verse 18. Jesus says, No man taketh my life from me. I lay it down myself. That's what Jesus said. David right here is telling King Saul, he says, Nobody's making me go out there. I'm putting, my own, I'm putting my own life on the line. I'm doing it. Nobody's making me do it. Just like, <coughs> just like Jesus said. Like I said, always look for it. It's always there. Just yeah. You just, you just got to remember it. That's why the Old Testament and New Testament, it fits like a glove. Yeah. They go together. David says, don't let these men worry or feel defeated because of this giant. That's what he's telling them. Now, really, get the picture. Can you get this picture? We have a boy, and you have a men, an army of men, and this boy is saying, hey, don't worry, I'll take care of this. Now, how would these men feel? How should these men feel? A, a boy? A boy saying, hey, don't worry, I'll take care of it? <laughs> to these men? Well, that's how it is in our life also. That's how it is in our life. When you go out and fight the giant, well, we don't fight. The Lord says we stand. All right? But when, when we face the giant, people are like, they can't believe what they see. These men right here of the army of Israel, surely they can't believe. This boy, is, this boy, he's going to go up against that giant. They can't believe what they see. Huh? Well, that's the way people are with us. When they see us in a situation in our life, and we go through it with no fear, no worry. What's wrong with this guy? 
Amen? Amen. We have God. Those who don't know God don't know. Right. Don't understand. But we do. With verses, with, with stories like this in the Bible, and these are true stories because this is in the Bible. This has really happened. When a boy can go face a giant and everybody's looking at him like, I can't believe this. Verse 33. Yeah. And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against the Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. In Numbers 1-3 it says you had to be 20. That's where I got it from. In Numbers 1-3 it says you had to be at least 20 to be in the army. And in verse 34, And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep. And there came a lion and a bear and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him and smoked him and delivered him out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and smoked him and slew him. David has shown that he is a true shepherd because he is willing to give his life for the sheep. Now there's a shepherd and then there's what you call a hireling. A hireling would not give his life for the sheep. If he sees a bear or something come, he's taken off. But David is a true shepherd. Right here he says he'll go up against the lion or the bear. John 10.11 Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. That's just like David. Amen? Amen. I mean, just you, you can put them together. David is, after, is a man after God's own heart. And right here it shows it. Jesus said, I give my life for the sheep. David did the same thing. David was shown what he would do for his father's sheep. And the Lord is showing us, if anyone tries to take us away from the Father, what's he going to do? Just like... David saw bears or lions trying to take the sheep away. See, he'll snatch them out of his mouth. Well, when we belong to the Lord, it says no man can pluck us from his hand. Right? We are protected. We are protected. Now, a sheep, we have a lot of sheep. People who are a lot of sheep or like sheep. Sheep is the dumbest animal. Sheep don't... They have no, I mean, I don't think they think they have no common sense. They nothing. Okay? I mean, anybody can tell you. Ask anybody who knows anything about sheep. They'll tell you, man, they're about as dumb as you can be. <laughs> well, the Lord gave his life for sheep. Yeah. We're just like the sheep. We got people who will deny and reject Jesus when he's offering them salvation to live with him in heaven. But they're that stupid where they can't see Okay, you can come to heaven with me and live forever in glory or you can go to hell and burn forever. And that's how stupid we are. That's a hard choice for us to make. <laughs> Die to self and go live for the Lord or do I want to live for self and burn forever? But does that mean, really seriously, is that simple? Is that clear? Right. But how many people are lost? How many people can, are not accepting the Lord? And they, and they hear the truth. Because God said, I'm going to enlighten every man. So every man hears the word of God. Every man. But how many lost people do we have out there? That's why he compares us with sheep. Because sheep are dumb. Now we're dumb also until we, until we accept the Lord. Right. Once we accept the Lord, now we're no longer foolish. We're no longer dumb. We have more wisdom to, than the most intelligent professor or whatever, scientist, whatever. We have more intelligence than they do. Mm-hmm. We have more wisdom than they do. Because we saw what we had to pick, what, what we had to choose. And we made the right choice. They see it. Like I said, God enlightens every man. So they have seen it and have rejected it. Now who's the smarter person? It's funny the Lord compares us to sheep. Okay. Verse 36. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them. This is what David is saying. Seeing he had defiled the armies of the living God. He didn't say he, he defiled the armies of Israel. David saying he's defiled the armies of the living God. He's going against my God. That's what he's doing. That's what David is saying. 
He's going against my God. And this nobody, this little boy, will do the same. It says, with that, what he did with the lion and the bear, he said, I'll do the same thing with this Philistine, uncircumcised Philistine. I will take the fear of Israel out of his mouth and kill him. Now he wants to show what he would do for his heavenly father. He's going to show what, what he's going to do for, with his heavenly father with him. Verse 37. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me. This is where the faith comes in. David is saying, he will, just like he did it back then, he says, He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Is David taking any credit for defeating the lion and the bear? No. He gives all the credit to the Lord. And that's what we should do. Oh, my great faith. No, baloney, you don't have great faith. We do not have great faith. You know why? Because it's from God. The, the Lord, God has given us our faith. You remember that? I show you that God, our faith, the, the Lord gives us our faith. So we can't brag on how great faith we have because it comes from the Lord. Okay? So we can't brag about things. We can't. And then just like David here, he, he didn't take credit for it. He gave the Lord credit. David has total trust in God and, he's, and he fears nothing that comes his way. This giant has come his way. And David is not, he's had the lion come his way, he didn't fear him. He had the bear come his way, didn't fear him. Now this giant, same thing. Now, that's like us again. We see the Lord working our life over here, and we're like, oh man, that was something, you know, that's God. You could just like, whatever it is, you're just like, God. But then later on, something else pops up, and you're like, oh, scared again. Forgetting what happened over here. Forgetting how God got you out of the trouble over here. We have a very short memory. Israel did that all the time. When you hear about Israel in the wilderness. The Lord was always getting them out of trouble. But they always forgot. Well, that's us too. It's a good thing that David, who was about, like I said, about 18 years old, wasn't like the Israelites who in Numbers 13 and in Numbers 14 were afraid. Because they sent... This is when they sent the spies into, uh, into the promised land. And out of the 12 spies, 10 of them said, Oh, there's giants in the land. We cannot go in there. Y'all know the story, right? right. Mm -hmm. Okay. These 10 men, again, saw giants. We can't go in there. And what did God tell them over and over? I got the promised land for you. This is the promised land. It's yours. God has told them it's yours. Joshua and Caleb. It's our land. Let's go get it. Right. But the other ten were like, No, there's giants. People, we don't have giants in our lives. Y'all hear me? I'm telling y'all right now. We do not have giants in our life. Because everything that looks like a giant with these eyes is nothing. Y'all hear me? Mm -hmm. It is nothing with God. Amen. There is not a giant that, that God can handle. And if God is with you, do we need to be afraid? No. This is a great teaching. We need more Davids. We have very few Davids in our lifetime. I'm talking about Christians. I'm not talking about lost people. We have Christians who are more like the Israel, like the army of Israel than David. Right. God told Moses to tell the people, after all the miracles I did for them, they still doubt me. This is back in the wilderness. After all the miracles I did for them, they still doubt me. God said, that's the promised land. It's yours. Israel still were, they were afraid. Right. And then when they said, okay, okay, we'll go. God, God said, oh, don't go because I'm not going to be with you now. Right. Again, they disobeyed. They went and what happened? They were slaughtered. When God said, it's yours, go, they disobeyed. But then, but then when God said, don't go, they win. Right. Is our life that way with the Lord? Right. Or is our Christian life that way with the Lord? If it is, we need to learn from it. Okay? I'm not asking you as a question. I'm just saying, if your life is like that, when He says go, you don't go. And when He says don't go, and then you go. 
You got no one. We have no one to blame but ourselves when things don't go right. Okay. Verse thirty-eight. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet of brass upon his head. Also he armed him with a coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, assayed to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off of him. David says, I'm not used to all this armor. Uh, what I have, what the Lord has given me, that's what I can use. And that's us today. We don't need everything in the Word of God to make it. What the Lord has revealed to us, that's all we need. Right. That's all we need to make it in life. What He has revealed to us so far, whether you're a young Christian or an old Christian, whatever He has revealed to you, that's all you need. David said, hey, this is too much. Because I'm used to this. Verse 40. And he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of, out of the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had, even in a strip, and his sling and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. And the Philistine came on and drew near unto David, and the man that bare the shield went before him. Now we always thought that it was just David and the giant, David and Goliath. But right here it says that he the, the giant he had his armor bearer with him. So it was David against two of them, and the giant and his armor bearer. Verse 42, And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him for was but a youth and ruddy and of a fair countenance. And the Philistine said unto David, I, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with a stave? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. To David he was a dog. Hope you all got that. <laughs> Verse 44, And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I'll give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air and to the beast of the field. Goliath made a positive confession here. We're going to see where positive thinking gets you. I mean, Goliath, he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to feed your body to the fowls of the air, to the beast of the field. Verse 45. Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts. Amen? Amen. <laughs> okay. Amen. I love that verse. <laughs> you come to me with a sword and a spear and a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord. Amen. The God of armies of Israel, whom thou hast defiled. David tells him, you have material weapons. I come to you in the name of God. <laughs> <Gosh>. Amen. <laughs> I mean, do people read this? Come on. You're coming with me with all this physical stuff, these weapons. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord. Amen? So, come on. When you see stuff out there like that, physical stuff, whether it be persons or things, hey, I'm coming in the name of the Lord. I don't need spear and all this stuff. I'm coming in the name of the Lord. Amen. Verse 46, This day will the Lord deliver thee into my hands. This is David. This is a little boy. This day will the Lord will the Lord deliver thee into my hand, and I will smite thee and take thy head from thee, and I will give the carcass of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God of Israel. Do we live that way? Can we learn from this little boy? Do we live this way? Y'all need to go home and read those verses again. Just sit there and read them to yourself. Over and over if you have to until it hits you. What he just said. Goliath. David saying, Goliath, it's not going to be the way you said. You doing this to me. It's going to be the way God said. What, what you said you're going to do to me. And I've had a teaching on this. What the enemy wants to do to you, God's going to do to them. Amen. And this is a, and this is, shows it right here. David said, what you just said you was going to do to me, God told me this is going to happen to you. Amen? amen. Gosh, we have such a... <laughs> whew, amen. Verse 47. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saved not with sword and spirit, 
for the battle of the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. I'm sure David remembers Zechariah 4, 6. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. By my spirit, saith the Lord. It's, by, it's not by might nor by power. And all the believers will know the Lord saves with the spirit and not with weapons. Verse 48. And it came to pass when the Philistine arose and came and drew nigh to meet David, that David hasted and ran and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. He ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. This little boy. David didn't walk in fear, not knowing what was going to happen. He ran toward the giant because God had already told him, I'm giving you the victory. God had already told him that. He told him to back way back. He told the whole army of Israel this. But they didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. They didn't receive it. David took it and received it. And he ran toward this giant. Because he knew God was with him. Verse 49. And David put his hand in his bag and, and took thence a stone and slang it and smote the Philistine in his forehead that the stone sunk into his forehead and he felt, fell upon his face to the earth. Now the reason David took five stones, now there was only two, right? The giant and his armor bearer. So if he had faith, people might say, well, he should have just took two stones if he had such great faith. No, he took five stones. You know why? Because Phyllis, the Goliath, had four brothers. Goliath had four brothers? So just in case they were in the background, he had one for each of them. <laughs> it's in the scriptures. I mean, it, it's in the scriptures, but you have to uh, study it out. But Goliath had four brothers. There's not a verse that says he had four brothers, but if you read it, and when it gives all the generation, blah, blah, you know, all that and stuff. And David knew that. Yeah. That's why he took five stones. He didn't know that, though. He just showed up that day for the battle and said, I'll do it. I don't know. Maybe the Lord revealed it to him. David knew what he had to know. Just like he knew that God would be with him when he attacked the giant. So what did happen to the? Well, I'll let you read the story. But what happened to the armor bearer? Uh, I would think he ran for his life. <laughs> I mean, when he knocked that giant down, the armor bearer's like, oh, "I ain't standing here." <laughs> he didn't kill both of them. Like, no, it no, it doesn't say that. Now remember, back in verse five, it said that he had a. Goliath had a helmet of brass on his head. Helmet usually covers the forehead, but God can, I mean, that stone had to penetrate the helmet, through the helmet, and his forehead to kill him. God's word can penetrate anything. Right. God's words can penetrate anything. That helmet on Goliath couldn't stand a chance against that stone, which the Lord delivered. David slung it. But I'm sure they, uh, God took that stone and hit him right where he needed to be hit right. to kill him. Verse 50. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and with a stone and smote the Philistine and slew him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Therefore David ran and stood upon the Philistine and took his sword, the Goliath sword, and drew it out of the sheath thereof and slew him and cut off his his head therewith. And when the Philistines saw when the Philistines saw their champion was dead, they fled. Just like like I said, just like the armor bearer. Yeah. Uh, the armor, I'm sure he did the same thing like the rest of the Philistines. They <laughs> they fled. When they saw their giant fall, they were like, look what I say earlier. When you see your leader fall, yeah. was that gonna make you braver? Yeah. No. They didn't want to. They didn't want to stick around to see what else David could do. Right. Amen. Amen. Because if this don't build you up, if this doesn't build you up to be a, a strong, mighty Christian, then I don't know what will. Right. We have a choice to make. You, you have a choice to make. You can be the army of Israel and run, or you can be like David. A man of God and attack whatever this giant is. Amen? Amen.